Hi, I'm Gus Chakala, project management expert. Today's topic is project risk management. And we're going to go through these topics and just break down what we mean by project risk management. So our first topic is, what is project risk management? And I like simple definitions. My simple definition of project risk management is a threat to success. So this raises a question. What is project success? How do we define success? Because if we're, if we're looking for threats, we have to know what the definition of success is. Most people, if I ask a project manager, fill in the blanks. My project was successful because it was what? Usually three things. We talk about on time, on budget, and I call it on spec. A lot of people have a different way of saying that. You might say quality. You might say satisfied customers. You might say delivering the scope. I say all of those three things really mean I'm delivering to the specification that I'm solving the problem that this project was meant to solve. OK, so here's success. On time, on budget, on spec. So now if we think about the definition of project risk, project risks are threats to success. So we're going to look at the threats of how we come on time, the threats of not coming in on budget, and the threats of not delivering to solve the problem that this project was uh, came from. So, so that's our definition. There's a lot of uh, definitions you can see out there, uh, long definitions. Uh, and for, for example, for the PMI has uh, the, the PMBOK, the Project Management Body of Knowledge. We can see a lot of different uh, ways of looking at this. But the way we're going to break this down is to say, well, if we have a, a threat to the time, to the budget, and the specification, the question is, how do we plan for risk? And the way I think about this is, we plan for risk by doing these activities. However, the reason we think about the idea of planning for risk is the, is the question of, does every project have the same approach to risk? And here's my answer. If you look up in the dictionary the definition of a project, one of my favorite adjectives that I see is that every project is unique, right? I say, sometimes I say it's the opposite of manufacturing. Manufacturing measures success by having no defects. Everyone looks exactly the same to the specification. In our world, in projects, we have a spec, but that spec tends to be different from the last project. So therefore, when we're planning for risk, we have a unique approach to every project. Therefore, risk planning and identification analysis and, and, and monitoring is going to come out of something unique about this project. It could be something as simple as you got a project manager who's overworked. What's an overworked project manager going to do? An overworked project manager is going to cut corners. Let me ask another question. How many organizations actually do this well? If you're a project manager working in an organization and you believe that project risk management is important, but the organization doesn't think it's important, oftentimes we'll, we'll fight, find resistance. So, the, so here's, here's my thinking on this. Does your organization support the idea of the value of project risk management? And here's how I think about it. When we think about defining or how we're going to approach uh, risk management, here's what I think about. Risk management is an industry. It's called insurance. So let's think about insurance as, as, as a model. We have choices with insurance. Let's say you just bought a brand new house with cash. And I'm saying cash because if you have uh, a mortgage, your mortgage company makes you ha to have um, a risk policy, right? Uh, a homeowner's policy to, uh, to prevent from damage. But let's say you just spent $500,000 on a brand new house and you pay cash. You have a choice to buy or not the insurance. 
Now, here's why, why risk management, selling the idea of risk management can be difficult. Let's go down the outcomes when you buy insurance. You buy insurance on your house uh, and, and you spend insurance on that house for 20 years and you sell it. And after 20 years, you never had a claim. Okay, so one of the outcomes is no claim. And you spend $20,000 over 20 years. Does that feel great? No. It's a good outcome that you didn't have a claim, but now you spent $20,000 and you didn't get anything out of it except for sleeping better at night. So some people don't like to do that. Buy an insurance, not getting anything. How about something <clears throat> does happen? You actually get a claim. Do you celebrate? You spent $1,000 a year and now your basement is underwater? Most people don't celebrate when there's a claim on insurance. How about if you don't buy insurance? Is that a good idea on a $500,000 house and you get lucky and you get no claim? That's not smart. It's lucky, but it's, it's, it's really not smart. How about you have no insurance and the house burns down? You just lost $500,000. What's, what's my point? My point is when we plan for risk, one of the things we have to think about is, is the organization willing to buy insurance to really have this process in place and to actually mitigate uh, risk, so so uh, or, or or have contingency. So so we're gonna have, when we get down here to planning, we're gonna talk about these kinds of things, <clears throat> about about mitigation and contingencies. There are forms of insurance that we can use to reduce risk in our projects. Okay, so here's another question. In my experience dealing with a lot of organizations, I like to ask which one of these one, two, three, four options of going after insurance, doing risk management. My experience is a lot of organizations don't buy the insurance and just hope there's no, not a claim. Okay, so you as a project manager or, as a, or, or, or somebody that works in a project-based organization, you've probably seen projects fail that have had poor risk management, known risks, but we didn't do anything about it. Okay, so that's sort of the idea of the definition and some of the planning. The first qu real question is, are we going to do it? The second question is, if we are going to do it, how are we going to do it, right? So the way I think about this is, if we think about a project plan, I'm not, I, don't mean a, I don't mean a Gantt chart, I mean a plan, right? A, a project plan is a series of plans that work together. A resource plan, a communication plan, a scope management plan, a risk management plan, right? So one of the many plans that come together to, to, to make a comprehensive project plan is something we would call a risk plan. Our plan to do these unique steps in my project. So what does that mean? What it means is if we're building a work breakdown structure of the tasks that we're gonna do in this project, one of those tasks is, is gonna be these activities that flow into the normal part of a project plan. We're gonna come back to that when we talk about monitoring. When do we do risk monitoring? In the same flow we would do for the other control activities for a project plan. So once we have a plan for risk, now we go into the project and we start to go through the steps, okay? So when we think about how would we identify threats to the success of a project? Or what would I say, what are the sources of information that would give us the identification? And usually the answer to that is one of two things. And I'll ask the question this way. Let's say you went to your local insurance broker and you said I want a life insurance policy for a million dollars, what's the first thing they hand to you? They give you an application. And when we see the kinds of questions that they ask in a life insurance, basically 
risk identification of this candidate. What risks are in your life that may increase or decrease the policy premium? Okay, what are they going to ask? Lifestyle questions. Do you scuba dive? Do you smoke tobacco? How much alcohol do you consume every week? Do you jump out of perfectly good planes with a parachute? Are you a race car driver, right? So, what, so typically what we would call that in the project risk management world is something like a checklist, okay? So if we were thinking about product development of a new pharmaceutical, could we have previous experience in looking at the profiles of the risk that happen in the drug development process? Or for information technology, what kinds of things go wrong in those kinds of projects, right? So, so if you went out on a search engine and said, show me samples of risk identification checklists for pharmaceutical development, for IT development, for architectural and design, for aerospace and aircraft, okay? We can find all these things based on experience not only across industries, we can also have these specific to your organization. If you're in the aerospace industry and your company's name is Boeing, you may have ex specific experience about the products and the specific business lines that you've been in for decades. So that's one example. So think of a checklist as a profile, how we can profile the risk in a project. Okay, so um, if we had an example, we might see categories in a checklist, just like we would see lifestyle categories in a life insurance application. So a checklist around technologies, a checklist around sponsorship and, and funding, risks about in a category of outside uh, help, or just, just like resource ma management in general, okay? We can talk about categories around the project plan, and there's, and there's, there's a lot of things, right? We could talk about um, the budgets, the schedule specifically, right? These are the threats that we're looking at. So the, the other thing that happens is, because we're in this unique world, we say, uh, a question would be, is the checklist gonna be comprehensive? And the answer is never. Right? If you're in a unique, unique project, we think about, well, what else is there beyond the checklist? So how would we do that? Well, we go to the people who know the most, right? The people who are building the solution against the specification are the best people to tell us where there's risk. So how do we collaborate? We would call that brainstorming. And how do we do brainstorming? We bring experts together, the ones that are closest to the, to the actual build of the solution, and, and, and we augment our checklist with any specific areas in this project. I'm gonna come back to this. Let's talk about analysis. Now we've got our list. We have a, a, a long list of potential things that have gone wrong, and the question I ask here, are all risks created equal? And the answer is no, they are not. So now we have a sorting process, an analysis, analysis process to put these things into categories. So how do we analyze? Well, typically we're thinking about something like what is the impact of that risk and what is the probability? They're the most common vectors or measurements to give us how different are these risks because they're not equal. So how can we give them weighting, a, a prioritization of impact and probability? Now, in addition to that, if we do impact and we do probability and we start thinking about, well, which ones are really gonna get some attention, some investment, some uh, a cost in the project to mitigate our contingencies. So eventually we're gonna get out of here a third dimension, which is what's the cost? So how would we do impact and probability? Well, we have two methodologies. We have quantitative and we have qualitative. What is quantitative? 
Well, that's measuring impact, right? What's qualitative? It's relative comparisons. For example, we might see three levels of qualitative that is high, medium, and low. How about probability? We could have quantitative percentage, or we could have a qualitative high, medium, low. Okay? In the insurance world, they have a profession of mathematicians that are called actuaries. Right? So if you want to know the impact, the cost, usually impact is measured in dollars, at least in the United States. Okay? In monetary relief, because we, we think about impact, we could talk about uh, satisfaction, you can talk about, in, in a court of law, you might think about um, uh, damages. Okay, like emotional damages, PTSD, for example. Okay, so in most cases, impact quantitatively is going to be a measure of the cost of repairing the damage if this risk actually happens. Okay, how about probability? Probability is quantitatively is percentage. How many occurrences per 100? That's what percent means, percent per 100. OK, so, so when we do analysis, we get a lot of information. A lot of um, what we see in project risk management is oftentimes not quantitative monies, not specific accurate percentages. There are qualitative high, medium, low, high, medium, low on impact and probability. Now, this creates a challenge. If I tell you we had a lot of risk on the project manager, hey, hey sponsor, we've got high impact, high probability. Are we going to plan to mitigate that risk? We would like to think the answer is yes, but the reality is a lot of projects have, some, have a lot of high impact, high probability analysis, or profiles we might say, and, and we still may not have the willingness to spend money to get rid of this risk or to reduce the probability of that risk or to reduce the monetary impact of that risk. Okay, so this is where it gets real tricky, right? When we think about going from identification and analysis and actually going into this idea of mitigating or creating contingencies, let's talk about this. What we're really talking about is, when we get into contingencies, what we're talking about is, I would say, the difference, the difference between the definition of a risk and the definition of an issue. What's an issue? An issue is a risk that happened. OK, so here's a question I like to ask. And usually I get a different answer than what I'm looking for. If, 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 a, if an issue is a risk that happened, is every issue preceded by a risk? And most people say no. I'm going to ask a clarifying. If you said no, here's my clarifying question to you. Is every issue preceded by a known risk? And if we say no, now let me go back to the first question. Is every issue preceded by a risk? Yes. Is every issue preceded by a known risk? No. OK, so we may not identify risks, and therefore things are going to be happening. So sometimes we have these things called the unk unks, the unknown unknowns. So those things happen. The other problem we have is, let's assume um, we're in a situation where we're willing to mitigate the high impact and the high probability, and we're going to put money at it to either do mitigations or contingencies. Well, what is a mitigation versus a contingency? A mitigation is an attempt to reduce probability and or impact. A proactive spending. Now, what do we call insurance? When you get a bill, what does it say on your bill? It says premium, right? So are we willing, are we willing to create a premium, additional cost, to mitigate a risk that may not ever happen, but we're going to spend money up front to make sure it doesn't happen. Same thing you do with your car. 
right? You drive a car for 20 years, you buy insurance, you spend money up front, it's a mitigation, you, you spend that money, you may not ever get anything out of it other than peace of mind, okay? Contingency is something else. Contingency says we've got a plan, but the plan is really issue manage it, management. We have some things we're gonna do if it happens. The only thing we're doing proactively is to have a plan to manage this risk if it becomes an issue. Now let me think about my, my, my least favorite examples of risks that get us into trouble. So when we decide the high impact, the high probabilities, and we put a plan around that, whether it's a mitigation or a contingency, here's a question I like to ask. What do we do for an example of high impact, low probability? It's unlikely to happen, but if it happens, it's going to be a disaster, okay? Now, some organizations do things like disaster recovery, okay? So we do, some, we do have some examples where project risk management does, in fact, get covered a, a type of insurance where we are spending money proactively to mitigate a high-impact, low probability. But let me go back to human nature, things in our lives that we can talk about. If we think about the number of high impact threats in our society that we think are low probability, like for example, we had, um, we had a, a news story last week. This is um, uh, a near miss of a uh, asteroid hitting the earth, okay? So high impact, low probability or percent. Let's just put percent there. High impact, low probability. Um, you can go on YouTube and find a lot of discussions with NASA about what we may do at some point in the future, but we haven't done it. Um, another example, um, how about avian flu about 10 years ago, right? There were pandemics in, in previous um, uh, uh, history uh, where millions of people died with the pandemic. High impact, low probability. I think the, 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 the most um, big impact one was, I think, in the 1920s, so almost 100 years ago. Uh, what do we do about it? Pretty much nothing, okay? Um, I've read articles that said you should have three months of food in your house. If a pandemic hits, you're gonna, uh, if you leave the house 90 days, within the 90 days after the pandemic hits, you have a 50% chance of losing your life. How many people have three months of supplies for your whole family in your house. Now that's relatively low cost on a high impact and, and, and typically human nation, uh, nature is we don't do much about it. Let me give you another example. 109 years ago, we had something called a coronal mass ejection, a CME, and that triggers what we call an EMP. And the Carrington event of 1859, Carrington was a, a British uh, astronomer who documented a coronal mass ejection that hit the Earth. In our geological record of the Earth, they happen about every 150 years. According to my math here in 2018, we are nine years after the next one that's going to happen. Now, the CME that was documented in 1859 took down the U.S. telegraph system, okay? If it happened today, every integrated circuit on the planet or the majority will be fried. No cars, no wells for your water, no uh, ATMs, no nothing, right? So how many people have done anything to do about that? Now, we can go on and on and on, but my point is human nature is we don't, we, we, we usually use a strategy of hope on the high impact, low probability. And what's the point? The point is it's a pretty tricky step to go from here to here, especially in a world where businesses don't want to spend a lot of mitigation money on high impact, low probability. Here's the problem. You know what happens with high impact, low probability risks? They happen. Okay, and if you're the project manager and decided to not take this analyzed risk um, and not mitigate and not, uh, not do a contingency, there's another outcome from analysis. It's called accept. 
We accept the risk. It's low probability, it's high impact, the money's not there to pay for it, therefore we're not gonna do anything about it. Well, guess what? Once it happens, it's no longer low probability, it has, it's actually 100%. It just happened, it's hard to explain, okay? So, so a couple of things happen here, right? When we do risk planning, and we do, we do these plans for mitigation and contingency and acceptance, now we have what, what I would say the, the control cycle of project management, right? It's every project has a cadence. When I worked at IBM back in the late 80s and early 90s, we had a definition of control. You were, now they called it an objective definition. Either you were or you were not doing risk management. You were, you were or not doing collecting actuals. You were or were not staying on top of the scope. So the things we talk about in monitoring, either you were or not doing a regular cyclical check on the plan against reality. So here's the problem. If we don't do control cycles, if we don't, and one of those things that we monitor in the control cycle is the natural rhythm of the project that should include the monitoring of risk. Why? Do risks stay stable? Do risks change their profile? Can a risk be high impact and, and suddenly have no impact? Uh, my example on that is the uh, Challenger disaster. You know, if those solid rocket boosters had been jettisoned before they blew up, they wouldn't have been a risk, right? So different phases of the project, the profiles, not only the analysis of the projects, or I'm sorry, the risk, but the actual risk we, we in fact have identified, new ones can uh, come up and old ones can go away. So the idea is that we are monitoring risk. How about when a risk happens? Is the project manager the first one to find out about it? Probably not. Right? So there is also a communication plan that says, how do we find out we have a risk? How do we deal with the risk? How do we communicate the risk that's now an issue? What if we didn't have a contingency and a proactive issue management? So all these things get dialed into risk management. And what does that mean? The risk monitoring goes throughout from the beginning of the planning for risk, from the identification that's ongoing, the analysis that's ongoing, the planning that gets updated, and that happens to the end of the project. So that's risk, that's project risk management. So uh, we have um, some additional information we can share with you. Uh, we have webinars that have, um, uh, to go for an hour on this topic. Uh, we have uh, full day workshops that we can do on this and we customize to your, your unique situation how we can put this process in place because as I said before, a lot of organizations have decided not to buy risk, not to buy insurance, not to pay the premium, to, to put the cost in, to get the contingencies, to avert the disasters that are over the next horizon. So what you see here, this, this whole topic, this complicated uh, picture of project risk management, I'll bet a lot of you came in here thinking risk management is pretty simple. You know what? It is. You know what risk management is? It's not even human. It's organisms, right? The sunflower faces the sun. So this is something we do by instinct. But when we get into the really formality, this is a lot, right? So if you think this is a lot and, and you want to really break this down into a more organized set of topics, uh, go click on our link below from the video and we will give you a slide deck that has all this information but categorized in separate pictures from each of these phases of risk management. So I hope you got a lot of, out of this today. Uh, if you want to go deeper, we certainly have more materials you can go to. Thank you so much. I'm Gus Chikawa, project management expert.